and our online family and friends. It is my desire that the Lord would keep me. And I pray it's your desire too. We want to thank you so much for joining us on tonight. We pray that you will share this video with your family and friends. Our scripture tonight will come from Psalm 25 verses 1 through 5 from the New Living Translation. And it reads, Oh Lord, I give my life to you. I trust in you, my God. Do not let me be disgraced or let my enemies rejoice in my defeat. No one who trusts in you will ever be disgraced. But disgrace comes to those who try to deceive others. Show me the right path, O oh Lord. Point out the road for me to follow. Lead me by your truth and teach me. For you are the God who saves me. All day long, I put my hope in you. In this psalm, David expressed his desire for guidance. How many of you need God's guidance? I don't know about you, but I need God's guidance every minute, every second of the day. So how do we receive God's guidance? Where do we look to find his guidance? Who do we go to to find God's guidance? So the first step is to want to be guided and to realize that God's primary guidance system is in his word, the Bible. By reading the Bible and constantly learning from it, we will gain wisdom to know God's direction for our lives. David simply asked for God's guidance, God's direction. When we are willing to seek God, to learn from his word, and obey his commands, then we will receive his specific guidance. Our song today is, Keep Me Lord, Keep Me Lord, Keep My Mind, My Hands, My Feet, Lord, Keep All of Me.
our Father, we thank you, Lord. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for keeping us. We thank you for wrapping your arms around us. We thank you for your grace that you showered upon us. We thank you, Lord, for blessing our conditions to be as well as they are. Lord, we worship you today. We magnify you. We lift you, Father God. We thank you for just being good and being God. God, we praise you for another chance, another privilege, another opportunity to hear your word, to read your word, to study your word, to be blessed by your word. We ask you to keep us now, Father God. Bless us this day that you, Father God, will speak to us clearly. Bless us to be receptive of your word and bless us to walk with you by way of your word. It's in the strong, mighty, powerful, anointed, anointed name of Jesus of Christ we pray and we ask it all. Amen. Thank God. privilege, another opportunity to come to worship you and to honor you, Lord, thank you. We're starting a different study on tonight, another study. This study is 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians, we're walking through the Pauline epistle, the Pauline epistles. Pauline is spelled P-A-U-L-I-N-E, Pauline epistles. This word means that the Apostle Paul wrote them. These are called the Pauline epistles. We have, we have done the book of Romans. We've done the book of Philippians. We've done the book of Colossians. We've done the book of Philemon. And tonight we're looking at 1 Thessalonians. Written by Apostle Paul. We're looking at the book of 1 Thessalonians. The book of 1 Thessalonians. Thank you to our visitors, our friends, to our neighbors, to our members for joining us again tonight. Our study is 1 Thessalonians. We'll begin 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 tonight, and then we will proceed to, to the other uh, parts of this book as we go forth. We are doing books of the Bible, and right now we're focusing on the Pauline uh, epistles, the Pauline epistles. Amen. Paul, the Apostle Paul is the author here. He's the writer. The Apostle Paul is the one that's writing this letter to the church at Thessalonica. The Apostle Paul is the author. He's the writer. But we notice in verse number one, the Apostle Paul is accompanied by Silas and Timothy. Look at what he says. He says, Paul, Sabanus, Sabanus, and Timothy. So he introduces the characters, and in this place, it is the these are the characters who are participating in the deliverance of, of this particular book of First Thessalonians. He says, Sabanius. Sabanius, Sabanius is, is the long word for, for Silas. So Sabanius is the Roman form of Silas. So it's Paul and Silas, right? You remember the story of Paul and Silas? And then they were locked up in the Roman jail and the jail rocked because of God coming by and setting them free. The soldier was about to kill himself because he thought he had lost control and lost all the prisoners. This is the same Silas. So Paul and Silas was locked in prison. They were locked in jail because of preaching and teaching the word of God, and God sent an earthquake. Earthquake rocked the jail. Paul and Silas stayed there. The prisoners stayed in the room. They, prayed, they stayed in the jail cells. 
the, the, the guard was about to take his own life. Paul says, don't take your life. We are all here. We didn't go anywhere. And so uh, those who, who were in charge, the, the people who were the authorities, in this case, uh, when you read this particular passage, you'll find out it was the, the city council members, the city council members said, let those men go. Paul said, no, no, don't let us go. Let them come over here and let us go because they the one that, that locked us up. So this is the same Paul and Silas. Paul with Sylvanus and Timothy. The three of them are, are writing and presenting this book of Thessalonians to the church at Thessalonica. Theologians believe that Paul is the one that's doing the writing, and he's writing based on the report that Timothy and Silas has brought back to him. Therefore, he relates to this church at Thessalonica, and when he relates to them, he reminds them that this is Silas and Timothy along with myself, Paul. Paul used to be called Saul. This same Paul that's now a champion for Christianity, he used to be the guy that killed Christians. He used to be the guy that, that locked up Christians. But he had a Damascus Road experience. He met Jesus on the Damascus Road. That's why Paul says that he was an apostle out of due season. What he means is that he was he became apostle, an apostle after after the season of apostleship was over. That's why I wonder today, how do we have so many apostles walking around? Because Paul says, I am the least or I'm the last. He says, I'm an apostle out of due season. I'm an apostle out of due season. So here we have Saul who's running around killing Christians, and as he moves from place to place, he finds himself on the Damascus Road. A bright light shone, shone and knocked him to the ground. Some say he was knocked from his beast, but the Bible says very clearly he was knocked to the ground. The voice of Jesus spoke to him. Why are you persecuting me, Paul? Saul, rather. Why are you persecuting me? So the, the name Saul means ask for. Jesus asked for Saul. The word, the name Saul means ask for. The name Paul means little. Theologians believe that Paul was a little man in statue. Now theologians don't do not say that he had the short man disease or the little man uh, thing going on in his mind, but he does declare that Paul was a little man, a short man in statue. So the word Paul means little one, the little one. Let's look at verse number one. It says Paul and Sylvanus and Timothy, Paul, Sylvanus, and Timothy, we talked about the fact that the three have joined to get this message over to the church at Thessalonica. To the church of the Thessalonians in God, the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. It is quite clear who they're writing the book to. When you address a letter, you want to make sure that you address it to the person that you want to receive it. You are the sender. And then you have a person who is the recipient. You want to address the letter to the right person. If you do not put the right address on it, then it comes back as insufficient address. So you want to address the letter to the right people. You want to send it to the right address. So it says, to the church at Thessalonians, the church of the Thessalonians, in God the Father... In, I and God the Father, in the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to remind you, I'm reading from New King James, so yours may read a little different. We study from the New King James Version. He says, God the Father. God the Father. So here we got Paul with Sabanus, who is Silas, 
and, and Timothy, they write this letter. Now, Timothy was Paul's sons in the, son in the ministry that we believe that Paul led to Christ. The word Timothy means honored by God. Honored by God, or it means God honored. The name Timothy means honored by God, or it means God honored. What it suggests to us is that God honored Timothy. It is believed that his grandmother, Eunice, gave him this name. Eunice gave him this name because she was a righteous woman. She studied the word. And therefore, you will find in the book of Timothy where Paul says, Stir up the gift that was in you that came from your mama, Lois, and came from your grandmama, Eunice. So, it is believed that the grandmother named him Timothy. Paul called Timothy timid. He was a timid person. He, and that's why Paul writes the letter in Timothy, encouraging Timothy to, to be of good courage, to make sure you don't be afraid of their faces. Oftentimes we use that to, to install a preacher, to remind the preacher that when you go to another church, when you become the new pastor, don't be afraid of their faces. Just preach the word. Be instant in season and out of season. This is Paul talking to his son in the ministry, one who we believe he led to Christ, talking to them and Timothy, telling him, don't be afraid. Stand firm. Preach the word in season and out of season. So these three men are believed to be highly respected by the church at Thessalonica. It is believed that they were highly respected by the church of the Thessalonians. So when you receive a letter from somebody that you respect, you listen closely, you read with intent, you look for the, for the message in the letter. So they get together, the three of them, and, and write this letter to the church at Thessalonians. And they say they're writing in God, the Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at what he says. First of all, he says in God. This word God is used here to identify the supreme deity. This word God identifies God as the supreme deity the supreme identity of God, the supreme divinity of God, the exceeding one, the exceeding God, the magistrate, deity, the first person of the Trinity. I know I just said a lot. Paul identifies that he is writing in God, God meaning the supreme deity, the supreme divinity, the exceeding one, the magistrate, magistrate, the judge, the first person of the Trinity. All that he takes his time to identify God. The supreme deity, the supreme divinity, the, the, extre the, ex the exceeding one, the magistrate, the first person of the Trinity. Father. Father is the male parent. The male parent. Regardless if your daddy is on the scene or not, you have a male parent. It also says to us that there can't be two female parents in God's eyesight. There has to be a male parent. There ought to be a male parent. The father. And it also suggests, and this is a sidebar from, from the text, but it also suggests that there ought not be two male parents. There ought to be a male and a female of the parent. <laughs> so God lays out an example for us by which we want to live by. God the father, the male parent, this word father means he is the generator of all things. 
He is the generator. He's the one that creates. He is the creator. He gets everything in motion. He puts everything in motion. God, the father, the generator of all things. He is the creator. He just lays it out and he says, God, the father, who's a generator, the creator, and the Lord Jesus Christ. This word Lord is the controller. This word Lord is supreme in authority. This word Lord means master or sir. This word Lord is the one who, who is the controller. He is supreme in authority. He is the master that we ought to call sir. I remember growing up as a little boy when the deacons would bow down in church to pray. They would say, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. What they're saying is, thank you, master. What they're saying is, is thank you, controller. What they're saying is, is, thank you, supreme in authority. The one who is a supreme in authority. Now, when Paul talks about Jesus, the word Jesus means Jehovah saves. Jesus describes the son of God, the savior of mankind, God incarnated or God incarnate. So, so Jesus is a controller. He's Lord. Jesus is the son of God. Jesus is Jehovah salvation. Without Jesus, there is no salvation. Wherever, wherever one, whenever one accepts Jesus Christ, he accepts salvation. Mm -hmm. But notice here, he, he describes this Lord, this controller, Jesus the Christ, as supreme in authority. I just told you that God the Father is the supreme divinity or the supreme deity. What Paul does here. In this first verse, in this very first verse, what Paul does, he tells us of the Trinity. He places Jesus on the same level as God the Father when it comes to authority. That's why when we pray, we don't just call on God. We call on God through the supreme authority, the Lord Jesus Christ himself. We got to we got to recognize Jesus Amen. that he has supreme authority. He cannot allow us to usurp Jesus to get to God. Mm. God will not allow us to go around Jesus and come straight to him. Because Jesus is supreme in authority. We have to go through Jesus. That's why when we pray young people that's why we pray in the way we be praying, senior citizens. We call on the name of Jesus. Yes, we lift him. We, we, we acknowledge him. Matter of fact, you can't even get in the door when it comes to God without acknowledging Jesus. When Jesus died on Calvary, the veil of the temple was rent from top to bottom. The veil was rent from top to bottom. And now we, Paul says, we can go boldly before the Lord. Go boldly before God. Go boldly with confidence. Because Jesus has laid the path for us. He did it on Calvary. Hallelujah. He did it on Calvary. Jesus the Christ is supreme in authority. God the Father is supreme in deity. God the Father, Jesus the Christ, work together as one. They are one. Mm -hmm. John picks this thought up and John says, in the beginning was the word. And the word was God and the word was with God. He moves to verse number 14 of John 1 and he says, and the word became flesh. In other words, Jesus showed up in the flesh. Yes. He is the word. There was nothing created without him. 
His name is Jesus. He is supreme in authority. That's why we have to be careful how we pray unto God because we got to go through Jesus. And when we pray through Jesus Christ, Jesus throws the door open and we can go in and plead our cases. God looks at the heart. God looks at the motives. But Jesus opened the door so we can even get in. You can't get in the house unless the door is open. The good thing about God is that he doesn't allow the gangsters to kick the door down. You can't be a gangster and think you're going to get everywhere you want to get, by yourself, on your own accord, any way you want to get there. You have to go through Jesus Christ. You don't just walk in and kick the door down. It, it bothers me to see preachers, especially young preachers, who think they can walk in hospitals and demand to see a patient who think they can walk in prisons and demand that they let them in. When you go in, you need to go humbly. Amen. And when you go in, you need to go through Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Jesus the Christ himself is supreme in authority. Amen. Look at verse number two. Paul talks to this church at Thessalonica. He talks to the Thessalonians and he says, we give thanks. He talks about we. He will change later and talk about I. But now he says, we give thanks to God always for you all. Making mention of you in our prayers. Look at what Paul says. Paul says, we give thanks to you always. Making mention in, in our prayers. He says, grace. Acceptance. This word grace is acceptance. This, this, word, this word grace in verse number one, it says grace to you and peace from God our Father, Jesus the Christ. Grace, acceptance. Grace, favor. Grace, benefit. Grace, pleasure. It says grace, grace, grace to you. He says grace to you and peace. Then he picks up this word peace. Peace means to be set at one again. He says he's giving thanks for him in verse number two, but he says before he gets to two, acceptance, favor, benefit, pleasure, grace, acceptance, grace, favor, grace, benefit, grace, pleasure. Says it in the text. Then he says peace. Peace. He says, peace from God. And this peace can only come through God. If you look at the daily Sunday school reading, um, you would have read by now that we have to enter into the rest. This word peace means to set at one. This word peace means rest. This word peace means prosperity and quietness. And he says, Paul says, that this is from God. You cannot really have rest unless you get it through God. Amen. You can have a cow king bed. Hmm. I just learned that. I thought that was just king size beds. I just learned. There are things that are called cow king beds. Hmm. And these cow king beds are huge beds. You can have a cow king bed and not get an ounce of rest, not get an ounce of sleep. So when you have peace, you are set at one with God again. Yes. When you have peace, you have rest, you, you have prosperity. Some people think prosperity comes with money, mm -hmm. but the text declares you can only get peace, you can only get prosperity through God. Mm -hmm. The reason why people are suffering today who have a lot of money, they can't get any rest because they are trying to usurp God, mm -hmm. trying to go around him, trying, trying to push him away, trying to leave him out. Paul says it comes from God. So you can't have prosperity. And then the final word here in, for peace is quietness. 
quiet as that. We, we were working in the back of a truck one day. We were doing a mission one day, and it was this this one woman. Yeah, 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 yeah. This is before I became a pastor in New Beginning. Thank the Lord. Yeah, 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 yeah. She's just going on and on. She meant well. But all she was doing is talking. We on the back of a of a 40-foot trailer working, trying to get mission work done, and she's just yakking, yakking, yakking. She meant so well. She said, well, Pastor, what do you need? I said to her, I need silence. I need quietness. I need rest in the air. I need peace. And she got it. Good old Christian woman, but she got it. Sometimes you just need quietness. Sometimes you just need rest. Paul says this kind of rest, this kind of peace only comes from God. Now let me rest to verse number two. We give thanks to God always for you, making mention of you in our prayers. He says we give thanks. This word thanks is gratefulness. Gratitude. It is gratefulness. It is gratitude. It is thankful. We give thanks to you, and it comes from the same word. We get the word thanksgiving as when we're eating a meal. Don't you dare sit down and eat without thanking the Lord and asking him to bless you for bless your meal. Thanking him for what he has given you and thanking him for what he is doing yes. through your meal. Thanking him for the meal. Paul says, I am thankful. I'm grateful. I have gratitude toward you all. He says, I'm thankful toward. And then he says, I'm thanking to God. In other words, because of who you are, and he's going to talk about later on who they are and what they do. But he says right now, I'm thankful for you. I'm thanking God for you. Always be thankful to God for things, people, places, and others. I am thankful to God for those of you who tune in every Wednesday and every Sunday. Amen. I'm thankful. It has been said if a leader is leading and no one is following, he or she is just taking a walk. Yes. Thank you that I'm not taking a walk. That's why I tell you, go ahead and share the video. Go ahead and, and present my convictions to other people. Go ahead and tell people to tune in. Go ahead, because I am so thankful. I am so thankful for the good people at the New Beginning Church. I'm thankful. I am thankful for their hearts. I am thankful for their gifts to the Lord. While we've been out, most of you have continued to give your tithes, your offering, showing forth your acts of love toward the man of God, toward my wife, toward the church. I am thankful for that. I'm thankful that you understand that you don't tithe and you don't give offerings just to pay bills. I'm thankful that you understand that your tithes and your offerings are connected to you and God. Amen. It's, it shows your privilege of giving. It shows your attitude toward giving. Mm -hmm. And we've been challenged in the last year like never before. Yes. And many of you, most of you, 98% of you, have kept right on giving. I'm thankful for Thank it. You, Thank you. Most of you have kept right on watching and listening and participating. I'm thankful for you. Thank you. Paul says to this church at Thessalonica, I'm thankful for you. I'm so thankful for you that, 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 that God has blessed you always. I give thanks for you always, continually. Give thanks for you all. He says, I make mention of you. We make mention of you in our prayers. Just the word mention. Let me just tell you what the word mention means. The word mention means, first of all, remembrance. He says, when I pray, you come to my remembrance. 
He says, I'm always mentioning you. I always make mention of you. I'm always mentioning you. I'm always bringing to my remembrance and to God's remembrance you. The second thing that the word mention mean, making mention, the phrase making mention means is recital. This word mention means recital. What he says is, what we have learned, we recite. Mm -hmm. Sister Davis and her music group have recitals from time to time. They used to have them once a year. Now they have them once a quarter. They used to have them once a month. <laughs> what, they, what happens in the recital is that they, they regurgitate, they bring up again, they bring to remembrance to the teacher what they've been taught. This, this mentioning of them is a recital. Amen. Let me tell you, there are some people that God has allowed you to meet that you ought to have a recital in your prayers over. Amen. You ought to have a recital. You ought, to, you ought to go ahead and demonstrate to God and demonstrate to those you pray for. You ought to just regurgitate it. Lord, bless them. Lord, I thank you for it. Lord, Lord I appreciate it. Lord, you, you know, some people would tell me that I talk too much about my parents, but I am so grateful. Mm. I am so thankful. Mm. I hated getting up at five o'clock in the morning and slapping halls, but I know I have a good work ethic because of it. Yes. I hated walking down mile long roads, chopping cotton in a hundred degrees temperatures. But I got a good work ethic because of it. I'm thankful for my parents. I'm thankful that they didn't let us go out and just buy what we want. I'm thankful that after we made our $5 a day, we brought it home and they decided what we did with it. I'm thankful for it. We're not in the poor house today because mom and daddy controlled our money. We weren't rich. We're still not rich, but we know it's not about how much you make. It's about what you do with what you make. Yes. What are you talking about, preacher? It doesn't matter how much money you make. It, is, it boils down to whether or not you give God the first 10% off the top. So you tithe your, 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 your gross and you budget your income. You tithe your gross and you budget your income. You tithe your gross and you budget your income. You don't pay dues off your gross. You tithe your gross. I'm so thankful for the word of God and how it has taught me to give freely Amen. back to the Lord. He says, I'm mentioning to you. I, I, am, I am creating a recital. <laughs> I am creating a recital every time. I am remembering you every time I pray. He says, my prayers, this word prayers means worship. Mm -hmm. Word prayer means to call out an oration. This word prayer means to, to call your name before the Lord. I am thankful for the community in which I grew up in because the senior saints would call out my name before the Lord. And you know, back home, they didn't care if children knew <laughs> whether they were calling out their name. They would call your name before the Lord while you're standing there. They would tell the Lord on you, Lord, he ain't headed the right way. Change him. If you have to knock him down, Lord, change him. They called out our names in prayer. And in the middle of worship, they would be in the middle of worship. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And just call out your name. So when we pray, prayer ought not be giving God a laundry list. Prayer ought to be worship. That's why we shouldn't be ashamed of prayer. We shouldn't be ashamed of prayer in private. We shouldn't be ashamed of prayer in public because prayer is worship. Mm -hmm. We ought to thank God. We ought to thank God in prayer that he has given us an opportunity to worship the great magistrate, to, to worship the great I am, to, to worship the exceeding one, to worship God himself, the controller, Jesus Christ. That's a privilege to me. I'm so grateful that God has given me an opportunity to worship him. Mm -hmm. So prayer ought to be worship. Prayer ought not be you telling God what you need. Prayer ought to be you entering into that rest. 
Prayer ought to be you coming to the, to the throne room of God and thanking God. You ought to begin, Jesus said, said, Lord, hallelujah. God, we praise you. We worship you. We magnify you, Lord. We, and, and when you get a common everyday mode of praying and talking to God like that, entering into God, don't go to God when you just need something. You ought to go to God in worship, in prayer. You ought to worship him even when you don't need anything. Yes, Lord. For years and years, for years and years, my daughter would ask me, Daddy, what you want for Christmas? I want my daddy to be healed and my daughter to be delivered. And I'm calling your name out in prayer. That's what I'm telling God about. That's what I'm, that's what I'm taking before the Lord. I will, I'm praying, Lord, heal my wife. Lord, d d deliver my daughter. Lord, keep my mama. Lord, keep the New Beginning Church. And in the midst of it, I'm worshiping. Yes. Lord, bless turning hearts. Lord, I worship. God, I praise you. We ought to come to God in worship. He's not a bellhop that we ought to go to God and, and just ask him to do this, do this. And Lord, why you had to get this done too? Mm -hmm. It's worship. It's worship. It's worship. It's worship. It's worship. Lord, we praise you. Lord, we honor you. Look at verse number three. Remembering without ceasing your work of faith, your labor of love, and your patience of hope in the Lord Jesus Christ, in the sight of our God, our God and Father. Look at what he says. He says, remembering, I told you, I told you earlier that when, when he says that he is going to make sure that he calls your name out, he's going to mention your name. I told you it was remembering, right? Remembrance. I told you it was a recital. Look at what he said. He says, remembering or reciting without ceasing your work of faith. This is where remembering means I'm keeping mindful of it. Mem remembering means to exercise my memory. He says, I'm remembering without ceasing. He's doing it, this, this phrase, without ceasing, means he's doing it uninterruptedly. He's doing it without omission. He's doing it without intermission. You know, when you go to a basketball game or a football game, there's a halftime, and when you get to that halftime, it is time now for intermission. Paul says, our prayers for you all, our thanks for you, we are remembering you without intermission, yes. without ceasing. We are remembering you uninterruptedly. We are remembering you in our prayers without omission, without intermission. Paul says that, that we remember you without intermission, and this is what we're telling God. God, remember their faith, their work of faith. This word work means your acts, your deeds, mm -hmm. your labor, and your doing. Your work of faith, your, your work, your, your acts, your deeds, your labor, and your doing. Are you doing anything in faith? Are you really acting in faith? Are you, do you have some deeds of faith? Are you, are you doing something? Are you laboring in faith? He says, he says that remembering without ceasing your work of faith, comma, your labor of work, your labor of love, your labor of love, your labor. I am remembering, we are praying, we are telling God, we are reciting before God, your labor of love. This word labor means your will, your weariness, <laughs> your trouble, your pain. In other words, you have done some things in your life for the Lord's sake. It's, it's a labor of love. And in this labor of love, it's not just doing it and making it happen. This word labor means you're getting weary doing it. This word labor means you're doing it while you're in trouble. And you're doing it while you're in pain. It's a labor of love. It's, it, the word labor means that you're in pain while you're doing it. See, people in the 21st century, they want to do stuff for the Lord, but they don't want no suffering. 
They don't want any pain. They don't want any trouble. They don't want any weariness. We want to get up, do what we do, and go back and lay down and go to sleep. We don't want to do it with pain. No, we don't want to be in pain. We don't want to do things and have pain. But sometimes this labor of love comes with pain. It comes with suffering. It, it, comes, it, it comes with weariness. And let me just share with you, you're going to have to do some things when you're tired. If you're going to walk with God, you're going to have to do some things while you're in pain. Remember now, he's talking about your work of faith. The word faith is your assurance, your reliance. You rely totally on Jesus Christ, so it's your reliance. You're relying on Jesus Christ. Now you have this labor of love. You have this work of faith, and you have this labor of love. And when you have a labor of love, you're going through some pain, but you're still showing love. The word love means affection. The word love means Charity. This word love means benevolence. And when you're, you're doing love and charity, or doing love in, with affection, or you're doing love with benevolence, it's a brotherly type of love. It's this word, we get the, the word Philadelphia, the, brother, the city of brotherly love. It is, it is the city of brotherly love because we love each other in a brotherly way. You've heard people say, that's my brother by another mother. You've heard the song, Ebony and Ivory. It means that there's a white person and a black person. They get together like brothers and they work in perfect harmony. It doesn't mean that you just got your biological brother or your biological sister that you have a labor of love with. It means we get weary, we get in trouble, we get in pain, but we still have love for the brothering of the church, for the brothering of the Lord. For those who are saved, it's a labor of love. It's a weariness. It's a trouble. It's a tired period. And, and we do it in charity and in love. And we keep right on doing it. We're tired, but we keep right on doing it. It's a, it's a labor of love. Then the third thing he says, patience and hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Patience and hope. This phrase, patience and hope. First of all, the word patience means endurance, means constancy. I mean, I'm going to be enduring it. I'm, I'm gonna, he talked about the labor of love and how much pain. He says, I'm going to endure it. He says, we got to be patient. We, we, we have to have some stick to itness. We, we have to have some consistency. We have to have some constancy. We have to have some endurance. We have to keep going through it. Let me tell you something. If folk back home would have given up on me, I wouldn't be talking to you today. They endure it. They endure it. Some, someday I have to tell you my story. Every person has a story. And preachers got more than, more than can be told. If the saints of God back home at Markham Missionary Baptist Church and St. James Missionary Baptist Church, the people in my neighborhood had given up on me, I wouldn't be standing here today. They were patient. They endured in pain and suffering. They endured. They were patient with me. He says, in patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. In patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. In patience of hope in the Lord, the master, the controller. You want to have patience. In hope. You want to have patience and hope. Finally, he says, in verse number three, he says, in the sight of our God and Father. You want to have patience and hope in the sight of our God and Father. We want to have, we want God to know <laughs> that we're struggling. One guy said, said that, said that uh, one guy says that sickness is from the devil. And when he said sickness is from the devil, then his wife got cancer, then sickness was no longer from the devil. Mm -hmm. Let me just share with you. And then he went on to say, if, if, if you get sick, it's because you sin. Let me just share with you. We all going to have some issues. Yes. 
you're going to have some struggles, but you got to do it with patience. You got to do it with endurance in the sight of our God, Father, our God, and in the sight of Jesus Christ. You got to do it for him. Verse number four says, knowing, beloved brethren, your election by God, knowing, beloved brethren, your, your election by God. And I want to close with that verse, verse number four. This word election means the chosen one. The word election means that you have been chosen by God. And if you're listening to me today and you are not saved, mm -hmm. I want to tell you, you've been chosen by God. Mm -hmm. Today can be your day to work for him, to present your labor of love. Today can be your day. If you would, just bow your head with me and receive Jesus Christ. Those of us who walk in this labor of love, those of us who pray for others without ceasing, those of us who work through this faith, it's because we're saved. You can be saved today. You need to try Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. The door of the church is open. The invitation is extended. Come to Jesus. Just as you are. Don't get it right. You would never get it right. Don't wait till you set it up. You'd never set it up right. Don't wait till the stars line up. Don't depend on the stars. Just trust him tonight. The door is open. The invitation is extended. Will you come to Jesus? It is all by faith. Believe in this one story that Jesus died for your sins. He was buried in a borrowed tomb. And he rose from the dead. If you can believe this story and trust this story to get you to heaven when you die, you can be saved right here, right now. The door is open. If you would, just bow your head with me and repeat after me and invite Jesus Christ in. I just want to lead you in this simple prayer. Please bow your head and repeat after me. Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. Now come into my life and make me a new person. Thank you for saving my soul. We believe if you honestly prayed this prayer, believing that Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, that it will get you to heaven when you die. We believe that you're now saved. You're born again. You are one of the chosen ones that God has chosen to be saved. You are the elect. You are one that God has chosen even before the foundation of the world. And there may be others of you who have received Christ as your Savior, but for some reason or the other, you've fallen short, you've fallen away. And, and we live in a time where there's a great falling away from the Lord and a great falling away from the church. You can come back to him tonight. Just ask God to forgive you. He will forgive you. Make a commitment today to get in church. Make a commitment to listen to the word, to read the word. Make a commitment today to follow the word, obey the word in the good times and the bad times that you will walk with Jesus of Christ and that you would do what he says, how he says it, the way he says it. I want to thank God for you who are listening today. I thank you for being a part of our service on Wednesdays and Sundays. It is now offering time. It's time to give to the Lord through tithes, offering, and sacrificial gifts. It's time to give to the Lord. Will you join me in giving to the New Beginning Church? You can go and give in three ways. First of all, we prefer you give by way of Zelle or by P.O. Box. You can give by way of Zelle or by P.O. Box. Uh, first of all, Zelle is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com, our Zelle account lifting.jesus at yahoo.com or you can give by P.O. Box our P.O. Box is P.O. Box 503 Missouri City, Texas 77459 P.O. Box 503 Missouri City, Texas 77459 and we still have our cash app available to you for those of you who still have cash app of course we're trying to move away from cash app but our cash app is cash tag NBC Souls. Cash tag NBC S O U L S NBC Souls. Thank you so much for giving today. Let me pray for your gifts and pray that God has 
has blessed you to give. Father, we thank you now and we bless your name. We thank you for every giver, whether they give electronically or by mail. We thank you for those who will bring their gifts. We ask you to bless them and keep them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and thank God. Thank you for joining us here tonight for our Bible study. We're here every Wednesday night on these same stations at 7.20 p.m. every Wednesday for Bible study. Join us on Sunday mornings at 9 a.m. for Sunday school. 9 a.m. for Sunday school every Sunday morning. And please join us online at 10.45 a.m. for worship service. 10.45 a.m. for worship service. For those of you who've been faithful and giving and faithful and listening, thank you so much. <clears throat> We're looking forward to our we're looking forward to our resurrection service on April the 4th. April the 4th, we're looking forward to our resurrection service. We will have a parking lot service, resurrection parking lot service on Sunday. We're scheduled to get started, get started in person at 1030 and begin our broadcast at 1045. Please, ma'am, please, sir, go ahead and prepare to be a part of our parking lot service on Resurrection Sunday, April the 4th at 10.30 a.m., 10.30 p.m. Please look forward to seeing you there. We'll be in the parking lot. And we'll be preaching Jesus. Pray for good weather. Pray for very little wind or no wind, no rain at all, no freezing cold. We just want to have a good time in the Lord. Uh, right there next to our 50-foot cross that's standing there reminding us of the resurrection Sunday morning, that Jesus Christ got up early that Sunday morning. He got up for you and me, got up for the betterment of all of us. Please continue to do your Bible listening. Your Bible listening is important. Your Bible listening, and you should be journaling. You should be writing down some notes. You should be writing down, you should be writing down some notes. You should be writing down some notes of what God is saying to you as you do your Bible listening. Please, ma'am, please, sir, do your Bible listening. And also, those of you who are receiving the daily reading that leads up to the to the Sunday school lesson, please participate in that and make sure that you just saturate yourself in the Word of God. We need Jesus like never before. We need the Word of God like never before. This is the great morning where people are just falling away from the Lord. Again, thank you. God bless you. God keep you. This is our prayer. Thank you for being a part of our service here at the New Beginning Church. Please, ma'am, please, sir, join us on Sunday morning at 9 a.m. for Sunday school, 1045 a.m. for worship service. We look forward to seeing you there. Look forward to hearing from you. If you have met Jesus tonight, please let me know by inboxing me and let me know that you met Jesus. If you have turned your life around tonight, please inbox me and let me know that that you have turned your life around and rededicated your life to Jesus Christ. Let's go to God in prayer. Father, we thank you now. We bless your name. We thank you for the assurance of Jesus Christ, the great Messiah, the anointed one. We thank you for what he has already done for us. We ask you to bless every listener, bless every watcher. Bless us, Father God, that we will continue to lift up Jesus, that he will draw all men unto himself. Here at the New Beginning Church, we are uniting the church, strengthening families, supporting schools, and empowering neighborhoods to impact the world as we are reaching souls by lifting Jesus. Jesus says, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. John chapter 12, verse 32. God bless you. God keep you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Thank God, and we praise him for you.